Okay, we'll start with this. Yesterday, north of the border, Jessica Kamara returned to the ring for the second time this year, this time in defense of her newly obtained WBA gold title opposite the ring bunny Hunter in what read a lot like a, a stay busy fight to me. And it is important for the fighters to stay busy in between big fights. You don't want to land a big fight and have to shake off ring rust in the process. So Jessica returned to action. Did the business. Jessica's a good fighter. Good, solid, serviceable fighter. Good mid-range to inside, on the move, on the outside. She does a lot of things well. She's not really big on power. She's got some speed, combinations, athleticism, movement. She's good in other areas. Though not big on power. Sporting a professional record of 14 wins with four losses, no draws, three knockouts, having been knocked out two times in 18 professional bouts. She's won some fights. She's lost some fights. The good experiences and the bad all round her out as a fighter and make her one of the somebodies at 135 pounds and you figure now that she's had this stay busy fight and gotten it out of the way the coming year may yield some big opportunities for jessica since she stayed wba gold champion i feel like jessica's schedule is in some ways tied to katie taylor's schedule the reason for it is because jessica holds a lesser version of katie taylor's title so what happens with katie affects what happens with jessica in the sense that if Katie Taylor beats Amanda Serrano at 140 pounds, perhaps she stays up there and has a trilogy with Chantel Cameron, vacates the title she used to hold at 135. So then it goes to Jessica. Think about it. If Katie wins against Amanda, maybe she has a trilogy with Chantel. If Katie loses to Amanda, maybe she has a trilogy with Amanda. Stays up there. And if she stays up there at 140, maybe she vacates the WBA title at 135 so it can then go to Jessica and then Jessica can unify that title with somebody else. Maybe. Or maybe. Irrespective of what happens with Amanda, Katie Taylor returns to the lightweight division and fights Jessica Kamara as her mandatory challenger. That's irrespective of what happens in the Amanda Serrano fight. There are a lot of ways it could break down, though you see what I mean. That what happens with Katie could directly affect what happens with Jessica. It all ties together. In a situation where Katie Taylor vacates the WBA title for any reason, any reason at all, Jessica could be elevated to full champion, at which point she could fight the winner of Dixon versus Harper. She could fight Beatrice Ferreira, this division's IBF champion. Boxer can make her an offer to come over to their side of things to box Carolyn Dubois, WBC interim champion. That could happen. A lot of things could happen, but the crooks of it is, so long as Jessica stays WBA gold champion, and she has, there are some big opportunities in the queue for her. She's done a good job of keeping busy. She fought three times last year, and she's already fought two times this one. There is still enough time left to wrangle a third fight, a third ring appearance for Jessica this year. There's still October, November, December. There's still time. The more she keeps busy and keeps active, the sharper she is. She's been spending a bit of time on this side of the border, on the West Coast, with the likes of Alicia Baumgartner. Training partners, sparring partners, perhaps. Perhaps if you follow either fighter's social media, you will notice that Jessica's been spending some time here in America on the West Coast. I think that's beneficial, broadening her horizons. A good idea. I don't know for sure how all of this is going to break down, but I guess the fight that I would like to see Jessica in the most out of all the aforementioned scenarios would have to be a scenario where she faces the winner of Dixon versus Harper. I like that fight the most. The reason for it is it could be competitive. It could yield a pleasing aesthetic. If it were Jessica Camaro versus Carolyn Dubois, I would be more or less settled that Carolyn will win the fight, likely by way of knockout, if it were Jessica versus Carolyn. Not as intriguing. Though still a good fight. If it were Jessica versus Katie, on the bounce or otherwise, I would once again be more or less settled that Katie can win the fight, would win the fight, if it were her versus Jessica. But Jessica versus the winner of Harper versus Dixon? There's more of a question mark there. It's the fight I like the most. We'll see if she gets it in the coming year. In the featherweight division, our continued coverage of all this past weekend's action, we saw former unified super bantamweight champion Stefan Fulton finally return to action over a year from his loss, his knockout loss to Naoya Inoue at a new weight against Carlos Castro. Gave him all he could handle. After the fight, Stefan said, they only remember the first time you say no or don't do it. You can't even enjoy a victory after taking your first loss over a year ago and constantly trying to overcome the mental part of it all. Alhamdulillah! 
for the good and the bad. I am just thankful and grateful. It was a rough night for Stefan Fulton. A rough night. He got knocked down off a hard, hard right hand hard. from Carlos Castro. Carlos was having a lot of success with the right hand. The problem was he wasn't doing enough to follow up. In a fight, we saw a more aggressive, a more come forward Stefan Fulton than the defensive specialist we were used to at Super Bantamweight. It seems like he was doing a lot more work in the pocket, letting his hands go a lot more in the pocket. Throwing combinations. Getting off good, clean, crisp punches, clear punches that you didn't have to look for. The issue was they weren't having any effect on Carlos Castro, that while Stefan is landing, he's not putting a dent in this guy. And what was a fun fight to watch, competitive, Stefan was knocked down off a hard right hand in round five. Fine. For that, I feel like Carlos Castro dropped the ball because after round five, after you realize you can hurt this guy, you can drop this guy, the next thought should be, I've got to stop this guy. And I feel like Carlos didn't capitalize. He let Stefan off the hook. Stefan survived the fifth round, got his legs back under him, hustled, and got back in the fight. Though later on in the fight, he was hurt by that same right hand. Damn, Mixed damn, feelings. Damn. Because Stefan Fulton didn't have enough sting on his punches to get Carlos's respect or put a dent in Carlos, hurt Carlos. Nope. And I've been watching Stefan Fulton a while, long enough to remember that he wasn't a power guy at 122, and he's not a power guy now at 126. That's a problem. Stefan's getting in with punches, he's having success, but there's not enough sting on them to get Carlos's respect, so Carlos is comfortable letting his hands go in the exchange. If there were more on the punches, Carlos might spend a little bit more time protecting himself instead of letting his hands go, affording Stefan more opportunities to hurt him. But he couldn't hurt him or discourage him, which allowed Carlos to let his hands go. He's perfectly all right with trading with Stefan since he's under no threat of being knocked out or being hurt. Stefan landed several clean left hooks, several of them. They just had no effect on Carlos. It's a problem at 126. He scrapes by Carlos Castro, wins a split decision, gets booed for it after the fight. I did see a lot of people saying they think Carlos should one. The fight was close enough that I'm not up in arms about Stefan getting the nod, getting the decision. I think it could have went either way, so it's going Stefan's way. It doesn't really bother me, though at the same time, it wasn't a strong featherweight debut. It's not encouraging. I want, because that's the weight class I'm number one for, and this is an eliminator for that belt. So with that in mind, Nick Ball, what have you made of his kind of trajectory onto the world scene, his performance against Ray Vargas? Um, when you picked up the world title last time out again, what, what do you make of Nick Ball? Uh, it was a close fight. Close fights should go to the champion. But, you know, it happens. It happens. Uh, and we'll see once we get past this if we can line that up. Stylistically, how do you think you and Nick Ball would perfect, match up? Perfect, because he seems to be like, come off as an aggressive, strong fighter. And what I, we've been working on in camp is perfect for that. Ray Savage, otherwise known as Raymond Foyt. I'd say that Raymond is a bigger puncher than Stephen Fulton, would you say? I'd say that Raymond lands with more authority than Stephen Fulton. Now you saw how his fight with Nick Ball looked. Nick Ball's a tough kid, great chin, great power, great cardio. At 126 pounds, Liverpool's Nick Ball is a fighter, a champion that has earned his stripes. And ahead of this weekend's fight, Stephen Fulton said, this fight with Carlos is an eliminator that fight. Whoa. So what are Stephen Fulton's chances against Nick Ball based on how he looked yesterday with Carlos Castro? Not good. Now some of what you saw had to be ring rust because it took over a year to get Stephen Fulton back in the ring. It took over a year. Some of that is ring rust. Some of that is him moving up to a new weight. A higher weight where the guys are a little bigger, take a better punch, give a bigger punch. The general perils that a fighter faces when moving up in weight, let alone a fighter who really wasn't that big a puncher at his old weight. He's not going to be a bigger puncher at a new one. Stefan Fulton, in a very general sense, is more of a cerebral fighter, a finesse fighter, a timing fighter. So imagine a fighter's timing when he hasn't fought in a long while. That Stefan Fulton should probably fight one to two more times before he shares the ring with Nick Ball. But can he do that, staying on the PBC side of things? Look at how long it took them to get this guy a rebound fight. He should go to Queensbury. Crazy, I know. But a former PBC fighter and Brandon Lee unbeaten Brandon Lee, he left the PBC and signed to Queensbury. So if Brandon can do it, Stefan can do it, and he should. Go over there. If the end game is getting Nick Ball in the ring, 
for Nick Ball's WBA title, do some business with Frank. If that avenue of opportunity is not afforded to you, then do what Angelo Leo did. Former WBO Super Bantamweight champion Angelo Leo, who after he lost to Stephen Fulton, ended up going to Pro Box. He's currently IBF champion at this weight after knocking out then champion Luis Lopez. Take a page out of his playbook. Might be what he has to do because he can't afford to waste any more time waiting for the PBC to sort him out. Look at how long that took for what was a little old rebound fight. At first glance, I don't like Stefan's chances against Nick Ball. That if it wasn't safe for you to trade punches with a Carlos Castro, it's not going to be safe for you to trade punches with Nick Ball. Nick Ball can punch, and he can keep the punches coming for all 36 minutes. It's not safe for Stefan Fulton to trade punches with Nick Ball. It's not safe for him to trade punches with Rafael Espinosa, this division's WBO champion, or even his old buddy, Angelo Leo. What? See what Angelo did to Luis Lopez? If he lands like that on Stefan, you don't think he can hurt him you don't think he could knock him out seems to be a much better weight for angelo leo a healthier weight for him and as a result of that he's got some pop it's not a good idea for stefan to get aggressive and trade punches with these people nope he needs more time and more time to acclimate to this weight before he so challenges any one of these reigning champions for what they've got and to do that to get those necessary fights in the interim he needs to change his decorum it's time to jump ship it's time to leave the island because the most the pbc is going to do for you is leave you on the shelf then cash you out with brandon figueroa that's all they're gonna do it's just a word to the wise it's time to go somewhere else take your business elsewhere to advance your career A heated exchange between Terence Crawford and Teofimo Lopez at the Sphere during the UFC show yesterday. Terence Crawford had a night on the town. He was in attendance for both Canelo's fight and the UFC fight, the UFC show. And when he was there, he bumped into Teofimo. Looks like he mushed him or gouged his eyes or something. What do you expect? From the moment that Terence Crawford beat Errol Spence Jr. last year, I noticed that Teofimo's been trying to steal his thunder ever since. I interpret it as jealousy. You can interpret it however you like, but what I see is Teofimo's trying to take the attention off of Terence. Why? Because he's doing very little to get attention on himself and his own career. He's been talking down Terence Crawford's victory over Errol Spence Jr., saying that Errol was basically damaged goods. That's convenient coming from Teofimo, whose career best win over Loma came against an injured Vasil Lomachenko who had a shoulder injury and he had surgery for it immediately after the fight. There's nothing made up about it. So if you're going to talk down Terence's victory over Errol, we can talk down your victory over Lomachenko. Over Josh Taylor. An injury prone, inactive Josh Taylor who arguably had already lost to Jack Catterall before Teofimo fought him. The message. Teofimo is in no position to talk. He's in no position to talk down Terence's victory over Errol when we can do the same thing with your victories over Lomachenko or Josh Taylor. Who can play that game? This kid spent over a year antagonizing Terence Crawford. This past August, while Terence was making his ring walk for the Madrimar fight, Teofimo was there, antagonizing him, along with all the other stuff he's been saying to the media. When you cross paths in real time and Terence puts his hands on you, it's no less than I expect and it's no less than you deserve because you're asking for it. A lot of the Canelo fans like to say, that Terence is clout chasing Canelo by pursuing a fight with him. I don't agree with that. In fact, I think that's pretty goddamn stupid. That he wants to fight Canelo, that in and of itself isn't clout chasing. To know what clout chasing is, you've got to look over at Teofimo, who's made it his mission to show up at all of Canelo's events to try to siphon some of the attention Canelo gets onto himself. Kissing Canelo's ass. Trying to bask in his glow, his light. That's clout chasing. When you call out Terence Crawford publicly for a fight, but you don't actually mean it. You don't actually want it. That's clout chasing. Go up to 154 then, you're so tough. What you really want is for the journals to write articles about you, and that's what makes it clout chasing. That you're not actually pursuing a fight, you just want to be in the news. When Terrence says 
that he wants Canelo. He's not saying that for any reason other than he wants the fight. He's not saying it for the people at Boxing Scene, or Bad Left Hook, or any other popular periodical. He's saying it because he wants the fight. And this is the fight game. Pursuing a fight doesn't make you a clout chaser. Pretending you want one, that makes you a clout chaser. You ask me why I'm so sure. Why am I so convinced that T.O. isn't after Terrence, he just wants people to write stories about him? It's because this is the same guy who just bailed on Brian Norman. It was supposed to be Lopez versus Norman in New York for the WBO title. And who killed that fight? Teofimo. What was his reasoning? What happened? Top Rank wanted to do the fight in New York at the Hulu Theater, and for some reason, Teofimo insisted they do it on the West Coast. The hell the point of that was, I don't know, because California's taxes ain't no better than New York's taxes. In fact, I think they pay more taxes in California than New York. That's what he said, though. A lame excuse. I think Teofimo didn't fancy that Brian Norman fight. Not yet. So a guy who doesn't fancy a fight with Brian Brian Norman, I think, doesn't fancy a fight with Terence Crawford either. You're just using his name to have people write articles about you. You're a clout chaser. You, your father, showing up to all of Canelo's press conferences, trying to bask in his glow, in his glory, trying to get him on board. You're a clout chaser. But regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, whether you're on Crawford's side or Lopez's side, Lopez brought this on himself. You've spent over a year talking this guy down. When you see him, what do you expect? What do you think he's gonna do? What do you think is gonna happen? I actually want Teofimo to get that opportunity. I would love to see him fight Terrence Crawford so I can see Terrence put him in the hospital for running his mouth, because I think the kid's annoying. I think he's a headache. I think he was a headache for Matchroom. He's a headache for top rank. You can't make a fight for this kid without there being some kind of problem. You can't make a simple Brian Norman fight without him screwing it up. He's a decent fighter. He's got a good resume, good so far. Better than Javante Davis's resume, at least. I will say, I think Teofimo has more heart than that guy, but when it comes to all this Crawford stuff, you're poking the bear, my friend. You're asking for it. Could be a lot worse than what happened at the Sphere yesterday. You could actually get that fight, and if you got that fight, I don't have a doubt in my mind, Terrence Crawford would lay you out like Sunday slacks. With an Argyle sweater. Because you're not on his level, and nothing you've been doing says otherwise. Punching above your weight.